Welcome to the X Corner. I'm here adding a little mutation to that superhero crew. I'll be covering the X Comics for the week of July 11, 2018. This week we have five comics. Domino number four, Hunt for Wolverine, Adamantium Agenda number three, Old Man Logan 43, X-23 number one, and X-Men Blue number 31. Spoilers, of course. We'll start with Domino number four. The writer is Gail Simone and the penciler is David Baldion. We start this comic finding more about the bad guys. Desmond was born the same day as Domino, and as we've already learned, everything that good happens to her, something bad happens to him. And it seems vice versa. He was befriended in the evil lab by the evil scientist's daughter, who it turns out was Topaz. Her father was trying to destroy mutants, as evil scientists do. And as always, it turns out she was one. We then jump to the present as Domino trains with Shang-Chi. She isn't doing very well. Meanwhile, Diamondback and Outlaw decide to go after the bad guys. They ask Deadpool where to find them and go off and get into a fight. The bad guy gets a name, prototype. He should have been Checkers or something. He and Topaz have taken over the lab where he was tortured as a child. Back in Hong Kong, Domino has gotten lucky by getting Shang-Chi to go out dancing with her. But then suddenly a bunch of his villains attack. This comic was visually amazing as always. The training montages were great, especially the very kung fu based one. The story was okay, nothing bad, but some quick resolutions as to where to find the bad guys was especially egregious. Deadpool being upset that he couldn't go beat up the bad guys was funny, but the monologue of Domino talking about dressing in sexy kung fu superhero cosplay fell a little flat for me. I really like Outlaw and Diamondback, especially Outlaw's cowboy talk, so I hope they survive, but it isn't looking good for the gals. This issue didn't feel as special as the others, and it does seem like I'm grading on a curve by only giving it a 7. But these ratings don't really matter, so just pretend I liked it, but it's not as much as the other issues. Then there is Hunt for Wolverine Adamantium Agenda number 3. The writer's Tom Taylor, and the penciler's R.B. Silva. Just like all the other issues we got in this mini-series, we go back in time to that incident where Logan blew up to save the new Avengers. I was getting a little bored with these, but in this one things started to get interesting. Logan says that he's going to help hold the superhero community together after Civil War. Which is neat, because after he died, there was crossover after crossover heroes fighting heroes. Nice retcon. But then he says he knows what Tony is hiding about the event with the bomb. I think the final issue will get the real reason Tony is really trying to recover Logan's body. Back in the present, the team is fighting Sinister in a sub, and Laura cuts off another of his hands before he teleports away. They have a prisoner and get him to reveal where Sinister's lab is. Tony makes everyone wear an Iron Man suit to break in, because of course he did. They find not a database with a superhero DNA, like they expected, but a storehouse of what seems like everyone on the planet's DNA. Oh, that's Sinister. The series started slow, but it's ramping up nicely, and I can't wait to see how it ends. There's some fun jokes, especially when Luke Cage said he was useless by plugging a hole and Spidey of all people insinuates the adult humor. Tony also says the last thing that anyone in the world needs is a bunch of Wolverine clothes running around, right in front of Laura. Foot, neat mouth. One more issue and I think this might end up being one of the best Huntful Wolverine books. It's a strong 8 out of 10. Then we have Old Man Logan number 43. The writer's Ed Brisson and the penciler's Juan Ferreria. Bullseye is back and it seems he's gone on a little insane. He's killing anyone who he thinks has done him wrong, including the reporter that helped Logan fight the Kingpin a few issues ago. He kills her, and Logan gets on his trail. He's accompanied by some woman from some Bullseye miniseries I never heard of, who is just out to kill Bullseye too. She has a cool suit, and Logan names her Vendetta. Anyway, they try to track down Bullseye, but he gets the jump on them and tries to blow them up. They rush to the room he was in, only to find a bunch of dead people with cards in their heads, and some graffiti calling Logan out. Once again, we're back to Bullseye, but this time he's doing his best Joker impersonation. And once again, the story can't end with Logan or Vendetta killing him, so what's the point? I guess they can have him arrested so Vendetta can learn the lesson that if she kills him, she'll just be as bad as him. No way this can end in any interesting way. So far, the story is an excuse for Bullseye to throw cards through windows, leaving only a slit. Last time I checked, he just never missed. Since when can he defy physics? The art was really good though, and I can't say it was written bad, just a terrible concept. It'll get a 6, and we'll see if I'm right about the trope fest to come. Next, we have X-23 number 1. The writer is Mariko Tamaki, and the pencil is Juan Cabal. 
X-23 is back to her old moniker, but at least Gabby is still here. The two are tracking down some bad guys who are trying to clone Wolverine for their own ends. They defeat them and go to Beast for some leads. He directs them to a missing geneticist who could be the link to whomever is recreating the Weapon X program. At the mansion, they run into the Cuckoos, who are clones too of Emma Frost. After some pleasantries, the two clone groups go on their way, but it turns out it was the Cuckoos who kidnapped the geneticist. They are mind controlling her to remake their two dead sisters. The two clone sisters are rapidly aging and aren't long for the world. Once the Cuckoos leave, the dying clones bring out a vial of Weapon X to save themselves. So I've said about Mariko Tamaki in her Claws of a Killer Hunt for Wolverine story, that she hadn't read many superhero comics before, and it showed. Did X-23 redeem that cruel thought? It was meandering, expositional, and wordy at times, but I have to say it wasn't bad. I was scared that they'd screw up one of my favorite new characters, but so far so good. When I heard that the Cuckoos were going to be the bad guys, I was afraid too that it would be the case of just all of a sudden them turning bad, like a certain other story that may be coming up next. But the story really made you care for these poor girls who just wanted their sisters back. This is going to be a story about sisters and how to deal with being a clone, I think I'm on board. Gabby talking to the Cuckoos was great, she called them evil looking choir and they agreed. Also Gabby did fist pump and yell clone power with them, and that was pretty cool. The undead looking cloned Cuckoos are super creepy, and I like where this is going. A very surprising 8 out of 10. Now if only Claws of a Killer turned around and stopped being so terrible. Lastly, we have X-Men Blue number 31. The writer is Cullen Bunn, and the penciler is Jorge Molina. Oh god, I'm so scared. Okay, here it goes. It starts off really good. In a flashback, we get Jean reading Magneto's mind when they first started working together. She finds that he's always reliving the Holocaust as a small boy, and tries not to let it happen again at any cost. Unfortunately, from there, it's a gradual decline. We get Polaris meeting Havoc in a park, and I'm getting hyped. But it's only to say how Magneto is insane and only has lucid moments, even though this has never been true, except when bad writers wrote him. Magneto goes off destroying Hellfire clubs looking for Emma Frost. He destroys a few while the young X-Men try and find Emma to warn her or something? Like she didn't know. They do find her in Paris, and she refuses their help right before Magneto attacks. So other than making Magneto to be a bad guy, even though he's just punishing the bad guys who tried to destroy the world, this comic I guess wasn't horrible. The art was pretty good. Their premise is totally flawed though. It's like they have to make Magneto bad every once in a while to keep copyright up of or something. He was much more interesting as an anti-hero, but now he's back to being portrayed as a destructive obsessed lunatic. There are a couple of nice Magneto pinups in the book though. I cannot wait for these young X-Men to go back in time and maybe have someone who understands Magneto to start writing him again. Cullen Bunn, like I always say, needs to go back to Venom Land and stop ruining everything. Why did I still read this, you might wonder? I've dropped books that have offended me less. I guess I'd do it out of hope. Hope that this will all just be a misunderstanding, and that they haven't ruined years of character development for some stupid story that really has no endgame. I will give this one a 5 out of 10, however. I think I'll choose to read it that from Meg's point of view, with some stupid self-righteous kids getting in his way to enact justice on the people who tried to destroy the world. Oh, and Bloodstorm is still ignored on the recap page, and even in the book. Now that's some racist sh**. So as I expected, X-Men Blue was a letdown. I guess it wasn't expected though, because it would have hurt less. I was optimistic that they wouldn't screw up this whole comic completely again. That was wrong. They did. X-23 though was a pleasant surprise, and Adamantium Jenna was good. Logo was pointless, but unoffensive at least. And Domino was steady as always. Next week, more fun. Oh, Clouds of a Killer number three. Yay. Ugh.